gentlemen, please, uh, may I have your attention, please kindly take a seat. Our session is about to begin. Today is the third day of web, which means in it is full spring, and I hope you're taking advantage of attending as many sessions as you can. Thank you very much for joining our talk today. My name is Saule. I'm a PhD student here at CAOS. In our talk today, we will take computing to the edge. Edge, da edge data centers are data centers that can support Internet of Things networks. To meet increasing demand, it is absolutely necessary to make these edge data centers both sustainable and resilient. In today's talk, Professor Simon Peter will address the question, how do we transform this next generation network systems, such as 5G and satellite networks, to be resilient to power supply issues? Our session today will be one hour with 50 minutes of Q&A at the end. And if you'd like to have more talk with Professor Simon, please join our open talk with him at 4 p.m. And also, please do not forget to join our session at 5.30 with Haley Moss. You don't want to miss that. We will be discussing such issues as neurodiversity, and it's going to be an exciting talk. So here to introduce our today's speaker and moderate the session is Professor Marco Canini, the Associate Professor of Computer Science at CAUST. Please join me in welcoming Professor Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to introduce Simon Peter, who will be delivering today's lunchtime distinguished lecture, Computing at the Edge, Power Resilient Edge Data Centers. Professor Peter is an assistant professor at the University of Washington in the United States. Simon works to improve data center efficiency and reliability by designing, building, and evaluating new alternatives for their hardware and software components. He currently co-designs networking storage stacks with new hardware technology to reduce service latencies by orders of magnitude beyond today's capabilities. Simon is a co-director of the University of Washington Center for the Future of Cloud Infrastructure, where he collaborates closely with industry to shape the future of cloud computing. Simon received the SIGOPS Hall of Fame Awards, three OSDI and SOSP Best Paper Awards and an IEEE Microtopic Honorable Mention, an a and, uh, NVMW Memorable Paper Award, an NSF Career Award, and he is a Sloan Research Fellow. Simon held the Joel Sort World Record in Energy Efficiency uh, Sorting in 2019 through 2021. Before joining University of Washington in 2022, Simon was an assistant professor at UT Austin from 2016 to 2021. He received a PhD in computer science from ETH Zurich in 2012. Welcome to CAUST, Professor Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for the very nice introduction. Thanks for having me. This is a great setup, exciting. So welcome to my talk. Um, I did actually give a talk to Marco's group virtually two years ago where I talked about my work in data centers and cloud computing. But unfortunately, there was very little time to talk about what's next. So this talk seems to remedy that. Um, it's going to be almost entirely forward looking. And to see what's next for the cloud, we got to look to the edge, namely edge computing, as we call it. And I'm going to explain what that is. And I'm also going to lay out some challenges to deploying edge computing and how we can overcome these challenges. Let's see if the clicker works. OK, here we go. Um, so, so what's edge computing? So there are a number of emerging cloud computing applications um, that are a little bit different from the applications that we would traditionally uh, implement for the cloud. So there are things like home health monitoring, where we use devices in the home to monitor the health of, uh, say, a recovering patient or of an elderly person, and the monitoring device is sending information into the cloud that's then processed there in order to figure out what the health state of the person is and perhaps raise an alarm to a hospital in case the health is deteriorating. Then there's home automation systems. This starts with simple thermostats for um, uh, HVAC systems, so controlling the temperature at the home to turn on the air conditioning if it's too hot or turn on the heat if it's too cold, but also includes home surveillance systems uh, that uh, 
surveil the perimeter of the home to figure out if there is an intruder, for example, and then might call the authorities. First responders are also increasingly making use of the cloud in order to gain situational awareness, to figure out where is the emergency, how many people are involved, what kind of care and help do they need, um, where do I have to go. And then, of course, we have self-driving cars, which use the cloud uh, to gain additional uh, information about road conditions, for example. And then there are also industrial monitoring uh, and manufacturing equipment, which is seeking to increasingly use the cloud as well. So the new thing about these applications is that they're all privacy sensitive. Uh, so think about health information, for example, which you might not want to share directly with the cloud provider, uh, and or time critical. The first responders, for example, need that information very critically in order to get to where the emergencies are quickly. And so those workloads are not easily supported by the kind of core cloud data centers. So in order to support these applications, the cloud has to come closer to the users, closer to where the action is. Uh, so that is what this slide shows you here. So at the top, I have the kind of traditional core data centers that we use to power cloud computing. So these are typically data centers that are uh, deployed in uh, locations where uh, land is cheap so that we can build large warehouses of compute. And power is generally abundant. Uh, we typically even have power plants right next to these data centers so that they can stay powered. At the bottom, we have our use cases. So that's where the sensors are, where the home health monitoring is happening, the first responders are, and the monitoring for industrial equipment is happening. Uh, and so in order to support these new time critical and privacy sensitive applications, we're increasingly also deploying compute at what we call the edge. So these are data centers that are smaller in scale, and they're deployed in places like cell phone towers um, or in containers if it's in a rural area or in uh, rooms in, in just uh, city blocks, for example. <clears throat> and so you can see that there's now the spectrum of compute, which is transforming how we implement applications for the cloud. Firstly, on the left side, we have this latency spectrum. So this is how fast can the cloud respond. And you can see that the closer we get to the users, the quicker we are in responding to them. And similarly, we have this kind of compute isolation scenario here, which is important if we think about privacy, in that the closer we go to the edge, uh, the more isolated the compute is. And so that means that there is less opportunity for attackers or for um, other tenants that might be sharing the same compute infrastructure to be snooping on our data. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking primarily about these new data centers that we're deploying at the edge. Now, in order for these edge applications to really work, these edge data centers also need to be critically available. Uh, many of these services I just talked about may be life critical, are time critical, or are otherwise high priority. And due to the sensitivity to latency, but also to privacy, there is much more limited ability to migrate workloads geographically uh, because they are time critical or privacy sensitive. And so that increases the impetus for these edge data centers to be powered to be available. So it's much more critical for them to always have access to power or just continue operating in case power supplies are more variable for them. Um, and keep in mind that this is less critical than uh, in traditional cloud computing, where typically we're able to replicate our data geographically across the planet. And so if an, a core data center fails, then we just fail over to another core data center. In those cases, the latencies don't matter. Um, but for these edge applications, they do. So it's not easy for us to simply fail over to another edge data center. And of course, in the core cloud, as I said before, power is also redundant, typically. We have these power plants laid out right next to the data centers, or we have access to multiple utilities that can provide us with power. That's much less the case in cell phone towers or uh, in containers in rural areas, or even in, in cities where you might just have access to one single utility. And if that power utility fails, then we have a problem with the edge data center. And so there are a number of challenges coming to powering computing even more generally. So this includes cloud computing as well, in that the number of natural disasters around the world has gone up quite tremendously. You can see this just if you look at the United States. We now every year have severe fires on the West Coast, uh, big storms in the southern United States, and frigid winters in the northeastern United States. 
And I can also quantify this for you. If we ask the uh, data center operators, they report that grid failures in the United States are already four times above the predictions when these systems were built, these data centers were built for the operation of uh, industrial and commercial power systems. Similar with the mean time to recovery from these failures, which are also four and a half times above these predictions for when these systems were built. Power can also be variable from the demand side, uh, and this is due to what we call black swan events uh, in cloud computing. So just to give you one core cloud example here, COVID-19 increased uh, the data center use of Google's data centers by more than 30x in the first quarter of 2020 because everybody was moving online due to the pandemic. And the main problem for them was not actually to provide kind of servers to power all of this compute, but really to get the power infrastructure there so that they could power all of this compute. And then finally, even under normal operations, these two scenarios I had before here are perhaps still exceptional scenarios, even though I say they will become more frequent. Um, even under normal operations, we see a much more variable power profile going forward. And this is because of a push towards renewable energies. So just to give you another example here from the US, uh, the US plans to use renewable energies as a primary source of energy by 2030 to 2035 time frame. I have here on the right-hand side the new generative capacity for the year 2021. And what you can see there at the top is that the primary new energy sources that are being brought online are wind and solar energy. And wind and solar, of course, have this property that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And so they have these swings of power production intensity. So uh, this can swing up to 50%, whereas more power available and less power available. And so if we want to power these edge data centers from green and renewable energies, then we also have to contend with the fact that power might not always be stable. There might be more power available sometimes, less power available some other times. And I also want to make this a bit more concrete and perhaps even personal um, to tell you a bit of a story here about what happens uh, when disaster strikes uh, that in interrupts the power grid. And so this example here is the Texas winter storm power crisis that happened from February 15 to 20th in 2021. I happened to be living in Texas at the time, so uh, I was there firsthand <laughs> basically experiencing it. And this was one of the worst uh, uh, power crises in Texas history, if not the worst power crises. Almost 5 million people were affected. Effectively, the entire power grid failed in Texas due to this winter storm. Uh, there were almost 250 deaths. And it was also the costliest disaster in Texas history, with almost $2 billion, uh, in the run rate of uh, uh, cost to, to property and, uh, and life. Um, I also want to talk a little bit to this picture that I have up here. So this picture shows you downtown Dallas from the Deep Ellum neighborhood, which is adjacent to downtown Dallas. Normally, Deep Ellum is a party neighborhood, so this would be these streets would be bustling with people. Uh, you can see everything there is dead in the streets right now because the storm has hit. You can see the snow on the streets. Um, you can also see that the buildings in the foreground are completely dark, while all of the buildings in the background in the downtown area are fully lit up, including the construction cranes and, and everything. Um, so you might wonder, why is this the case? This picture was actually common. I was living in Austin at the time where we had the exact same uh, picture. I was living in East Austin, so I was in the dark uh, neighborhood adjacent to downtown. I could see downtown where everything was uh, brightly illuminated, so they had power, we did not. And that is, of course, what kind of caused a lot of this disaster is that very few circuits could stay powered. Uh, so let me go into a bit more depth about what happened here. So firstly, to be sure, this was a power grid emergency. So the storm was raging between February 15 and, and 20, where temperatures dropped to minus 15 Celsius, or between 0 and 10 Fahrenheit if you're American. And you also uh, need to know that in Texas, we use primarily electricity to heat our homes. We have heat pumps, because most of the year, we just use it to cool our homes. And so we're critically dependent on electricity um, for heating of, of homes. The grid capacity of Texas, which is overseen by ERCOT, that's the body uh, that controls the entire power grid in Texas, that's short for the Energy Reliability Council of, of Texas, at the time was 77 gigawatts. And 
At the onset of the emergency in the night from Sunday to Monday to February 15, the demand due to heating of, of homes went up from 35 gigawatts before the emergency to 75 gigawatts. And you can see that 75 gigawatts was actually below the capacity of the grid. So we actually had enough generative capacity available to power everything. However, uh, what happened at the same time is that the supply of power was down at 45 gigawatts, down from 70 gigawatts, what's just before the onset of the, of the storm. And there are two factors here. One factor is that due to the, the freezing cold temperatures, some of the generative capacities from the power plants froze up. This was particularly gas power plants that had problems with this due to the, the cold temperatures. Um, but another big factor, actually, was just planned downtime of power plants. ERCOT had simply not predicted that there would be so much demand for power at the onset of the emergency um, that they had said, OK, some power plants should go offline for maintenance, should go offline because we don't need them at the moment. And so the emergency hit. ERCOT didn't have enough power to power all of these homes to be heated. And so what they did is something that's very standard for power utilities, which is that they instituted rolling blackouts of what they initially said would be 10 to 40 minutes uh, that were ordered at the night of, I believe, around 2 a.m. Uh, February 15. However, what they quickly discovered was that the critical infrastructure, uh, so this is like hospitals and things like that, which are primarily located downtown, so you can see where the lit up downtown is going, uh, required all of the remaining power that was still available. And so these rolling blackouts never rolled. We never got rolling blackouts. In fact, all that happened was that the downtown circuits stayed powered all the time. So these are the so-called critical circuits. And everybody else had to freeze through an 85-hour power outage in this freezing cold weather. Of course, these downtown uh, circuits, as you could have seen from the, from the picture on the previous slide, also included these construction cranes. And of course, there was no construction going on because it was freezing cold. Um, and so a lot more was on power than was truly critical. And that's, of course, a problem with kind of traditional power grid design is that you have a circuit-based model where the entire circuit either stays powered or you take the power from that circuit. And so everything downtown basically had to be there and stay powered, which prevented any of the other neighborhoods from being powered as well. So this brings me to kind of the explanation. Um, so it's not only the fact that the um, ERCA didn't predict that there would be such a severe uptick in demand, and so they ordered some of the power plants to go offline, um, but also that the demand side is very brittle. Um, there isn't really a good way to control say, only the hospitals to get power, maybe some other parts of the neighborhood to get power when it's critically needed, and to give back that power to the other neighborhoods so that we can have these rolling blackouts and, and actually avert the disaster. Uh, so to get into a bit more detail here, ERCOT's main job is to keep power supply and demand in, in balance. That's the main thing that you have to do if you're a power utility, because any prolonged imbalance of power supply and demand causes equipment damage, which is why there is a global timeout over the entire grid of about nine minutes, where if the, the equipment detects that uh, the supply and demand is out of balance for too long, the equipment will shut down. We call that a black start off the power grid. And it's critically important to avert that because restarting the power grid from a black start situation can take weeks, if not months. So the power would have been gone for, for a lot, lot longer. And if you read that ERCOT was four minutes away from a complete blackout, then that is correct. Um, five minutes on this timeout had already expired at the time that ERCOT decided we should move to these non-existent rolling blackouts. And so that's why a power utility has to have accurate forecasting and planning facilities so that they can figure out what is the demand going to be in the future and how much generative capacity do we have to either bring online or offline. And ERCOT has state-of-the-art planning and forecasting facilities. It's just that weather has become so unpredictable that in this case, even though there was ample warning that a winter storm was going to be coming, the prediction that ERCOT had was just that the storm was not going to be becoming this severe. And so the supply froze up and the demand uh, spiked. Um, and this is how we then, in addition to the fact that the existing infrastructure could not gracefully adapt demand to supply, could only keep one circuit per city alive. 
And not only is this a disaster for um, people that have to suffer through this, it's also a disaster for these emerging computing applications, which are critically dependent to be available. If power goes out in a neighborhood where an edge data center sits uh, to the cell phone tower or in a rural area where the container sits, then these applications cannot function. And so they would be prevented from being deployed. So what can we do? Um, can we do anything to still provide these applications and perhaps also lessen the blow of any kind of disruption to the power grid? Uh, and I argue that we can. Um, we can make edge data centers more power resilient. And compute is actually really nice because it is fungible. You can move compute around even within a data center. You might be able to time shift some of the compute because even within these critical applications, there are tasks that are more critical. There are tasks that are less critical. We even have a spectrum of kind of accuracy of answers that we might be able to give. This is particularly uh, important for machine learning applications, which are a major power consumer. And they can play the straight-off spectrum of turning on more or fewer neurons in a deep neural network in order to still give an answer, um, but perhaps with a little less accuracy. And we can then even prove uh, how good the accuracy of that application is if we turn off some of the, of the neurons. So this allows us to actually have these data centers be a major player in kind of working with the grid and reducing power demand if there's less power supply and give that power back to other neighborhoods, back to the grid. So we can trade off power performance and quality of service of these applications over time. To do so uh, requires us to do some work because traditional cloud systems are not built with that in mind at all. The assumption is that power is basically always abundant. Um, so in order to do it, we have to implement a feedback loop through the hardware and the software stacks of these data centers so that hardware can report how much power is being consumed in a particular server or a switch in the data center that the utility can report how much power is currently available, and that we can then also measure what inside of the applications can we maybe shift and avert so that we don't currently consume this much power for this particular application and maybe focus the power on some other application that might be more critical. And so uh, this is firstly unlike traditional resilience that people that work in kind of cloud system and distributed systems might be available, which typically consumes extra energy to provide the redundancy, a very typical way to provide resilience and availability is by simply replicating. But that, of course, means that we now have two, maybe even three x the power profile. So that can't really work here for these edge computing applications. So instead, we do this kind of time shifting thing. And so the result of doing this is that we can keep these critical edge applications available so that we can actually deploy them, um, but also provide much more graceful power demand response. Um, and like I said earlier, data centers are actually a really good partner here because um, they are already a major power uh, consumer. Data centers overall already consume more than 2% of the world's energy. And the prediction for this is to actually steeply go up as well. And this includes edge data centers as we use more and more of these compute applications uh, to power our daily lives. Um, another effect is, of course, that we could avert future power crises like the one that I just talked about and also further use it to minimize cost uh, just in operating these data centers because we can regulate how much power we're consuming. And power is one of the major operational expenses that we have inside of a data center. So if you have been working in this area and you have looked at kind of power proportionality uh, before, you might wonder why is now a very good time to do this? Um, for example, people at UC Berkeley have been looking at power proportional uh, data centers uh, back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and there have actually been a number of developments, primarily on the hardware side, uh, that allow us to kind of reinvestigate uh, re um, how we could shift workloads around and shift compute around from a software perspective. So just to give you a couple of examples here of the technologies that we now have available in data centers. Firstly, we have non-volatile memories. So these are memories that are able to, at zero power, still hold all of their data, which was uh, one of the major enablers here to uh, be able to shut down systems and then bring them back up quickly. This wasn't possible before. If you were shutting down a data center server, all of the memory that was in its DRAM would also go away, which means that restarting that server 
would take a really long time because you have to effectively load everything either from disk or maybe across the network. And this might be gigabytes and gigabytes of data, so it takes a very long time. With non-volatile memories and also uh, disaggregated memories, battery back DRAM, so CXL here is a new standard uh, for disaggregated memories. These allow us to shut down servers but still keep all of their data available across that shutdown so we can just snapshot it and then bring it back very, very quickly. Uh, so that enables rapid restart of our applications. Uh, chiplets are another trend uh, that allow for much more fine-grained power control. Another problem that we had in the kind of pre-chiplets world where we designed CPUs or servers as single systems on chips was that we could also just regulate the power up and down of this chip as a whole. And sometimes that would prevent us from regulating the power down if there were caches involved or other parts of the chip that were more intensely used by an application. And so we had to basically keep the chip running at full power in order to power this application. Chiplets allow us to build and design the same systems, but actually individually power up and down the individual chiplets on the whole system on chip. And so that enables us, again, uh, to have much more fine-grained power control. Smart NICs and programmable switches are new devices that are now deployed in data centers from a networking world. And uh, I argue that they also allow us to increase the power control dynamic range. Um, and that means that we can now actually save more power by, say, migrating some workloads or parts of workloads from server CPUs onto a SmartNIC CPU. The SmartNIC has a different power profile. It also has a different compute profile. But we have shown that some services can actually seamlessly migrate to these SmartNICs and continue running there and provide service so that we can shut down the major part of the server, which is typically the CPU. The programmable switches are also instrumental in, a, in order to enable us to have a very fine-grained and quick power control at scale in the data center. Basically, the switches can measure how much power is being consumed at a particular application in a server, report that back to a central power control plane, and the control plane can then determine how much power is available, send that information back to the switch, and the switches can then do locally power control of the racks that they are attached to, and so this allows us to uh, scale this power control plane that will regulate the power in a data center seamlessly across even a larger number of servers within these edge data centers. So with that in mind, what do we need to do in order to build this feedback loop? So a research agenda towards this uh, would have three steps. Firstly, we need more insight into what the applications want and what they need to compute and how much power that is going to consume. So we need energy provenance, power provenance, down to the function, ideally, inside of the application, uh, like a remote procedure call that executes some service, uh, but also into each hardware element, like is the power being consumed primarily for doing floating point computations or for doing some memory accesses. And for that, we need more hardware performance counters. Uh, we need to have infrastructure to read those performance counters and make sense of them. With those, we can then build energy models that can then allow these applications uh, to communicate how much, uh, what they want to do. And with that, we can then get insights into how much power that might consume and then proactively control how much of the application we want to run inside of in, in any instant uh, in time. And so for that, we need operating systems, mechanisms, and APIs. To, um, the second step would then be to enhance the power control dynamic range by making better use of these new hardware devices that we have inside of the data center. Current operating systems are not really designed with these devices in mind. So we need to leverage non-volatile memory, smart NICs, and these chiplets to have really high impact power control way beyond what is currently being done in data centers. Uh, we can then also use that to quickly migrate workloads between different heterogeneous compute components, say, by using disaggregated memory in order to use more or less power. And then once we have those two, the third step is to then build a service-aware energy optimization control plane for the data center. Uh, so for that, we also need some APIs so that we can figure out these, uh, um, these demands that these applications have and the power and report it to the control plane. Uh, but then also these scalable mechanisms, say, using the programmable switches so that we can elastically control where the applications and what parts of applications should be deployed. Perhaps even going one step further is this kind of idea of agile approximation that I mentioned earlier, where machine learning applications could actually, with provable guarantees, uh, give more accurate or less accurate results within uh, a limit. 
So I want to just leave you here with uh, two examples. Uh, we at the University of Washington have embarked on this course to kind of look at um, better power proportionality and power resilience for data centers and edge data centers. And so we've been building applications. And so I have one here um, that's an application level energy debugger called ePerf. If you're a systems person, you might be familiar with the Perf application, which does the same thing for performance. Uh, so this is the equivalent to look at energy consumption. Uh, you might be uh, aware that many of these cloud applications are, can be quite complex. Uh, they might involve many microservices, for example, running across many shared resources, many servers. And so we have to have a way to make sense of all of this. While the existing methods that we have in data centers are pretty coarse grain. Many of them operate at best at the CPU socket level. We can figure out how much power is being consumed inside of a single CPU socket. But of course, we want to account for power use across all of these devices, across servers, across uh, CPUs, down to the individual function call inside of applications. And so we've been building this ePerf tool uh, to allow us to, to do this. ePerf essentially, by measuring uh, one particular application under test, builds a model for a whole class of applications that we might run inside of a data center that infers their energy use. Um, we use uh, Intel's RAPL here to validate that model. RAPL is a power monitoring tool that is essentially exactly able to do this at the socket level. Um, but once we have this model built, we can use it to predict the energy consumption of the applications that are running in our cluster. Our first generation model uses microarchitectural features, such as TLB misses, cache misses. These are parts of a CPU that are very, very power intensive, so it makes sense to start investigating those first. Um, and then we evaluated our model to get um, a prediction of how accurate it is by using a, a holdout method, as, as it's called. So we basically have a whole bunch of applications that we want to deploy in the data center that I have here on the right side. Um, but the way that we build and validate the model is that we first look at just one of them, um, have it under test, look at how much energy is being consumed, uh, exercise some of the operations inside of this application, and then we check how well is the model that we have now built able to predict the power consumption of a whole bunch of different applications. So that's not including the application that we had our test, under test. And uh, we found that uh, we can actually predict it uh, quite well for um, single socket servers so far with just a 6% error rate. So our goal going forward, of course, is to expand the system to multi-socket servers and then even across servers so that we can measure and predict the energy for applications across entire clusters. Another um, system that we have been building, actually, in co collaboration here with, with Marco um, at Kaust, um, is a distributed file system that is able to operate on SmartNICs. That is the LineFS file system that we published together at SOSP 2021. It won the Best Paper Award there. And we can use this file system to actually build a powerware storage solution for our data centers. Uh, so consider a scenario here where we have uh, a regular storage stack, which typically replicates data within a data center as well. And one node that is a replica for this storage stack that's running our LineFS distributed file system. In a situation where the power is scarce, we might decide that the host CPUs of this replica should be shut down to conserve power. In a traditional scenario, that wouldn't work because we would have to run the distributed file system node there. However, in LineFS's case, we can actually temporarily migrate the file system from the host CPUs to the SmartNIC. And the SmartNIC allows the file system to continue to access that host's memory while the CPUs are completely shut down. And we did a little experiment to get some confidence that this is actually possible. So here we ran a mail server benchmark application from the Filebench suite on three replicas. And I'm showing the results here at the bottom of the slide. So this is a timeline graph. X-axis shows you time. On the Y-axis shows you the throughput in thousands of mail deliveries per, per second for this benchmark. Um, and so at time eight is where we decided that uh, there's not enough power available we need to shut down the CPUs off this server, and so we did. And you can see that during this period between time 8 and 16, which is where we bring the power back and the CPUs back, there's virtually no degradation in throughput for this workload. So the file system was able to seamlessly migrate over to the SmartNIC, continue to serve file system operations as a replica for this benchmark, and then eventually migrate back. Um, now, 
This might not be the case for any storage workload. There might be some storage workloads that don't operate as well on SmartNICs, and then we have to figure out is that still an acceptable level of service that we can provide, and we would do that with insights from the applications as what to their expected level of service is. But for this mail delivery workload, it worked perfectly. So that gives us some confidence that we can actually pull this off and build software stacks that can make use of all these novel hardware features to provide power resilience for edge data centers. So that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Um, so these emerging applications like home health monitoring, um, home surveillance, first responders, self-driving cars are critically dependent on edge data centers in order to provide the latencies but also the privacy requirements for these applications. And because they're often time critical and life critical, they need to critically depend on these edge data centers, which makes these edge data centers dependent on energy. And so we need them to be power resilient, to keep them alive through any sort of power event. And I argue today that we can actually do this uh, by building a control plane into our data centers that can control the energy demand much more gracefully than we're currently able to do. Um, by looking at what are the demands of the application side and then leveraging all these new hardware features that we have uh, to control and migrate workloads, shed some load if it is sheddable in order to bring back that, that power. And that then allows us to also disseminate that power out from these edge data centers back into communities, back into the neighborhoods, so that if we have a power crisis, we can actually avert it and save lives. I've shown you two examples uh, that are initial prototypes that we're building right now um, that start to bring about this, namely ePerf and a PowerWare distributed file system. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for this marvelous talk. Thank you, Simon, for the marvelous talk. So let's see if we have some questions from the audience. There are uh, mics lined up at either aisle. Thank you for uh, this nice presentation. Thank you. Just want to ask you, what do you think about the enhancement that need to be made on the software architecture uh, side, like uh, moving, like the Ethereum network and moving from proof of st uh, work uh, protocol to proof of stake, or uh, that need we need to think about the new uh, architectural or paradigm for the software side also that would provide uh, or drive the consumption lower thank you yes that's a great question so um there are a number of challenges that we have to overcome, but also I think a number of opportunities that we have. So the question here is about what do we need to do inside of the software stack in order to bring about this kind of fine-grained power control? So one of the uh, things that we can actually make use of that I think is an opportunity for us is this trend towards building cloud applications using microservices. Microservices are these fine-grained modules that are being used to build cloud applications. And these modules have very defined boundaries to them, which is nice because from a control plane perspective, we can actually say, OK, this particular module is not as critical as some other modules, and we can actually shut it down entirely, shed the, the module. Or maybe if the module is replicated in order to provide better, scale for, better scalability for a workload that is currently spiking and, and using a lot of uh, this, this particular service, we can say, let's reduce the replication factor off this module a little bit in order to save power. That works for these newer applications, and many of these emerging applications will very likely be built using uh, microservice architectures and so forth. Um, there's also the question about legacy applications um, that are traditionally built using kind of virtual machine technology. Um, here the story is a little more difficult um, because these virtual machines are typically bigger monolithic blocks. Um, but as a number of these hardware um, elements that I talked about are going to be very helpful here. So for example, disaggregated memory, so the, the, um, the means that you can take a service memory or part of a service memory and actually deploy it uh, away from the server, say in the same rack, allows us to uh, virtually seamlessly 
migrate these uh, virtual machine workloads from one server to maybe another one that consumes less power while still giving them access to the exact same memory that they had before. Traditionally, this would be something that is much, much harder to do. Virtual machine migration is kind of one of the big problems traditionally. With disaggregated memory, it becomes much simpler uh, to do that. So uh, those are two of the things that I think where we have good opportunities to uh, use the existing software infrastructure or the existing hardware infrastructure that we now have in order to bring about control of power for applications. Thanks. Uh, quick question. Uh, how about the security on the edge? Once it's in your data center, it's very easy to secure the switch, the hardware. But once you move this to outside, how do you guarantee the security? That nobody's tampering or destroying? That's it. Yeah, uh, security is, is always a problem um, and, uh, in fact, often works against power. <laughs> uh, so uh, the uh, security of the edge data centers is provided by the cloud operators primarily. It could also be telcos um, that are often operating these edge data centers as well. So the data centers themselves are still protected. Um, you can't just enter a data center easily and, and then tamper with those uh, devices. There's also a question as to sec the security of a power control plane, which is now we're basically putting the control of how much power the data center is going to consume into the hands of software. Uh, and so we have to make sure that the software that we're building can't be influenced, uh, intruded, or corrupted, and, and otherwise would uh, say, ramp up the power consumption of an edge data center, maybe even beyond what is spec for the edge data center. And I think for that, um, we could use verification techniques. We can actually verify this, this power control plane, and with that, potentially make it safer than if humans were involved in controlling the power consumption of the data center, because the humans could be corrupted. Um, there's often, the most often the attack on, most frequent attack on data centers is uh, done through phishing attacks, where uh, basically account information is being stolen from operators and then used to impersonate the operator, or maybe the operator is being bribed in order to do something. Um, that wouldn't be possible with uh, a, a verified uh, software-defined control plane for power. Yes, thank you, Simon. Very interesting talk and very relevant. Um, I, I'd like to know about uh, smart grids and smart cities. This is a buzzword. It's been around for years. But how far are we from implementing it? And uh, I don't know much about it, but what's your take on it? Sure, yes. Um, so the smart grids is a way to approach kind of finer grain power control from the supply side, right? So it's basically a way to uh, induce software into the grid itself so that we can much easier regulate where the power should flow, maybe also do this kind of um, what used to be much more forecasting-based um, in, into much more a response-based uh, grid where we just measure directly how much demand do we currently have and then ramp up or ramp down production on the, on the supply side. And so this is a, a dream, basically, that has been um, under investigation for decades now. Um, and I would say it's, there's, there's been progress that's been made, and it's, it's going to come. Um, it's been maybe a, perhaps a bit slower than was originally envisioned, uh, since grids are difficult to, to deal with. They typically move a lot slower than we do on the data center side, which is why this is kind of a solution to look at the problem from the demand side and just try to ramp up and ramp down power simply from a data center's operational perspective. Um, the, um, let's see, so the, uh, this is, so I would say that's why the, uh, the smart grid solutions are going to, are going to come. Um, it's just taking a little longer, and so this is one way to uh, do it much faster than, uh, than what we can do on the grid side. Grid is also, often very heavily regulated, which also prevents some of the uh, rollout of some of the uh, solutions, like startup companies have been stymied in that area as well. Thanks. Uh, time for one Hello, thank you so much. Um, my question has to do with, um, is this kind of technique helpful, applicable, of course, to uh, our main servers, the ones that are close to the power sources? Um, are there challenges involved with that that are different from the edge challenges and benefits that are different? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, also a great question. Yeah, so um, I talk here primarily about edge data centers. Um, you might wonder, could we use some of these techniques also in the core data centers? Would they help there? Um, and they do. Um, a lot of these 
technologies that I talked about also live in, edge data, in, in core data centers, and uh, we can also build these control planes for the core data centers. The problem is a little bit different in uh, the core cloud in that power there is typically redundant, so it's less of a problem of providing resilience to the power ever going out because the core data centers will have backup power, they will have generators, um, they will even have multiple utilities sometimes to choose from. Um, and so it transforms in the core cloud more to a cost optimization question where I could use this technique to make my data center more power proportional and to just simply reduce power use when I don't have as much workload that I want to run inside of my data center. So then it allows me to much more quickly and nimbly shut down a large number of my servers in order to save power and with that save a lot of cost there as well, which as I said is Power is one of the major operational expenses. Once the data center is built, you're primarily paying the power utility for powering it all. Thanks. All right, the real last question. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you, talked about the edge computing, but you didn't touch the uh, like, uh, term TinyML and microcontrollers, which we can do the processing on the edge itself. Uh, do you think that can contribute to the your work somehow? Mm -hmm. Perfect, yes, thanks very much for that question. So this goes exactly into the opposite direction. Let's go further into the edge, basically, go into even smaller devices, microcontrollers, maybe these monitoring devices might employ some of the microcontrollers. Um, yes, so um, I would say ostensibly the techniques apply there as well. Um, they might apply in a more limited way, though, um, and in fact, some techniques for power resilience actually come from the microcontroller world where power has traditionally been much more scarce, right? Um, there are kind of uh, people that do research in microcontrollers are now interested in kind of energy harvesting scenarios where there's virtually no stable power supply at all um, and you're trying to harvest energy just simply by, say, taking and reflecting radio, like radi radio signals. <clears throat> and so. Um, typically in that world, we might be even more constrained than the world that I have talked about, and the timescales that we have to operate within are even tighter. So instead of, say, you have one power event that might last for minutes, and you'd say, let's take down these servers and then bring them back, where we have a time scale of maybe a couple of seconds to bring them down and bring them back up. For these edge microcontrollers, it might be very intermittent compute, so it might be that um, I have one task to do, and that task would normally finish within one second, but I only have power to compute for 10 milliseconds at a time. So the solutions there are even finer grained than the ones that I've been presenting here. Okay, so that uh, concludes our distinguished lecture. Thanks uh, all for your questions. Thank you Please very much. Please join me to, to give this welcome gift to uh, Professor Peter. You. This is a simple token of appreciation. It's uh, your own, uh, um, I, I would say, this is not really power proportional, but it's hard physics. So <laughs> this is a um, oriental astrolite. Thank so. you very much. This is great. Thank you. And so with <clears throat> Simon is, uh, to remind you, is taking part in the open talk this afternoon at uh, between 4 to 5 p.m. in the auditorium lab lobby. Um, and I guess uh, that concludes this, this lecture. Um, enjoy your lunch if you haven't yet, and thanks for coming. Thanks again. Thank you.